Well, hi, everybody. It's uh, Joe Chaffee here on this uh, Monday, the 17th of December. We are about a week away from Christmas Eve. Hope everybody had a great weekend on what was really just an absolutely miserable weekend. It really was just horrible. Uh, even though I didn't see much rain on Saturday, Sunday was just an absolute wipeout. Uh, when it wasn't raining, uh, you had this you know, uh, light rain and drizzle low clouds it, it looked like it was basically dark all day long that low sun, sun angle this time of year and you get a setup like you did over the weekend it just it, it's just very depressing uh also uh forecast for sunday on the back side uh didn't really turn out too well with respect to uh a changeover to snow that that certainly didn't uh, happen except at the very end uh, had some mixing that occurred in some areas in and around new york city uh, whitened a couple of car tops here and there. That was about it. That was, uh, I guess, for snow lovers, it was a bit of a disappointment. Uh, I, I actually, you know, I, I actually, from a forecast standpoint, overstated it on Saturday. Uh, this is, was one of those uh, times that, you know, the Nam kind of led us down the trodden path, and it was it was the wrong path. Uh, it was uh, <clears throat> it was uh, too cold. Uh, with respect to temperatures that uh, with cold air such as it was and we knew there wasn't much of it but uh, it, it wound up overstating how much low level cold air that, that uh, did come down and then even with all the dynamics the upper low the cold you know the cold the, the dynamic cooling it just wasn't enough uh, kind of lesson learned to remember that you got to have at least a little bit of cold air around that's reasonable you can't have temperatures up well into the 30s all the way into upstate new york into uh, southeastern canada and i think that's going to help you so um you know always learning when uh, uh in, in the 40 years almost 40 years that i've been doing this uh you, you you're still always learning and uh, you uh, now will put that in the file, in the back of your mind, that uh, <clears throat> maybe the NAM isn't going to be 100% uh, or even 90% or 80% when it comes to these systems uh, going forward. We'll, we'll see about that. So <clears throat> as far as this week is concerned, uh, it's going to be relatively quiet here in the eastern part of the United States until we get to uh, Thursday. And that, at that point, we're going to be watching... Uh, this storm that's going to be evolving in the eastern part of the United States. We're going to see a low develop across the Gulf states and then right up straight north up the Appalachians. So it's it's basically going to be a, a windswept soaking rain and gales to the east side of it. And it's going to probably be a windswept soaking rain even on the west side of it because there really isn't a whole lot of cold air around. Uh, the storm itself will probably create some of that, what I would always call do-it-yourself cold air. That's kind of what we're seeing here in the east for tonight into Wednesday. Uh, but that's just about it. There's no Arctic connection. There's barely a Canadian connection as far as cold air is concerned. So it's going to ma make it tough for snow to fall during this week. Uh, in the long range, uh, the European model has left a crack open uh, in the door for the possibility of maybe a little bit of snow in the Northeast on Christmas Eve. And we emphasize a little bit, it wouldn't be a major system. This is just the model reflecting a weak system moving across the Ohio Valley and just kind of translating its way eastward. It's the only model that's doing it. The other models have a, a much weaker shortwave and a much flatter flow where it, it, it doesn't even do anything. So, um, I, you know, you'd like to see one of the other models at least join the party, but none of them are. So just the Europeans kind of standing alone in this. So I'll just say that the, uh, the, the, the door has been left open to crack for those of you who would like to see a little bit of snow uh, right around either Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. And we're going to take a look at a few other things tonight, including North America snow cover. And also we're going to look at uh, the long range, as we always do. So uh, welcome aboard uh, those of you from my Facebook page, meteorologist Joe Chaffee from Angry Ben's pa uh, Facebook page, Angry Ben's Angry Weather from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut Stormwatch page, and also from SS Storm Chase and Forecast Team uh, for the folks down in South Central Pennsylvania and North Central Maryland. Uh, the weekend rains, by the way, have also um, done a number as far as uh, rainfall totals for, for the year, annual records broken, 
a number of cities in North Carolina, 100 inches or more for the year. Washington, D.C., wettest uh, uh, year on record. Uh, the stations in and around New York City are all in the top 10 uh, as far as uh, rainfall, annual rainfall is concerned. And now we've got another event coming for, uh, for late this week. One second. I'm just going to... forgot to flip the light on just to get a little bit of better lighting here. All right, so let's... Uh, Let's uh, move forward and take a look at what's happening tonight because uh, we do have a little bit of action. Uh, some of this is leading the way to uh, our next weather system for later this week. But uh, you can see on the uh, watches and warnings map from the Weather Service, we've got some residual uh, winter weather advisories up for eastern Maine. We have high wind watches up and various wind advisories in parts of the Rockies, central and northern. Uh, we also have it for parts of the Northwest, uh, looking at winter weather advisories in the Northern Rockies and uh, right along the Canadian border, we're seeing some winter storm warnings up as we are watching uh, activity moving in uh, off the uh, coast. We should mention, by the way, that late this week with this storm system, the way it looks like it wants to play out, uh, we could uh, perhaps see some severe weather over uh, the southeastern U.S. and over Florida. Uh, particularly over the state of Florida. That's just, uh, I want to throw that out there because that is going to be definitely on the table with the pattern uh, that is setting up. Here's our satellite loop this evening. As we uh, watch, you can see the swirl in the upper right. That is the weekend storm south of Nova Scotia, snowing in uh, eastern Maine and New Brunswick, uh, more rain than anything else uh, on in, in Nova Scotia itself. And this is going to continue to move on to the northeast. But there's a lot of dry air from just south and west of New York City uh, on up through the northern plains. And as you go west, that air is not really that cold. Uh, the coldest air is in the northeast, relatively speaking. And that's it. Uh, also, you can see the action coming in from the west and some tropical moisture that's starting to feed up. Uh, another round of some tropical moisture starting to feed up uh, across the Baja Peninsula and heading toward Texas. So you're just kind of setting the table here for uh, the next weather system that's going to be uh, impacting uh, the uh, eastern part of the U.S. Now, I'll bring up the rainfall forecast from WPC over the next seven days. And, you know, the west continues to be, you know, pretty much uh, out of control with rainfall amounts on the order of um, several to many inches from uh, north, northern California all the way up to the Pacific Northwest Coast. Now, in the east, uh, this is all going to be for Thursday, late, late Thursday night uh, into Friday night. And you've, you, they're kind of, uh, they're going for more of the rain, but you see the big amounts are just along and offshore on the North Carolina coast and also over the state of Florida and out into the northeastern Gulf of Mexico. This is all convectively driven. This is, <clears throat> you know, from what I just mentioned earlier about the possibility that we could see some strong or even severe thunderstorms moving across Florida uh, during uh, the uh, during Friday. And it might be for a good chunk of the state, by the way. Uh, moving up the coast, it's a general inch to an inch and a half. Uh, this is one of those times where I wonder whether some of this might be a bit underdone, that it may be more on the order of an inch and a half to two inches in a lot of these areas going up and down the coast. They kind of have that reflected a bit in, from, from, from my area, northern New Jersey to southern New England, and also in a, in, a, in a patch up in southeastern, uh, the southern part of Maine, some of that, the eastern part of that is, is, is occurring right now with the leftover snow. But uh, perhaps these, might, these numbers might be a shade underdone, uh, given what I'm seeing in terms of the, uh, the upper air uh, going forward. The uh, radars tonight, uh, not really, <clears throat> you know, all that impressive. As we uh, take a look at that, uh, bring it up on the, uh, uh, our uh, where's our window? I got to find it. There we go. Bring up the window, Joe. Okay, so there we are. So here's our, uh, you know, radar from coast to coast. And it's really the northeast, the extreme northeast, the extreme northwest. And otherwise, there really isn't too much else happening. You got a little bit of precip up the Rockies. You got a little bit of precip up in parts of Texas and Oklahoma. And that really is it. Also, we've got some lake effect action going on in New York State with the winds coming in uh, off of Lake Ontario into uh, north central New York. Looks like some pretty 
solid action up around north of Syracuse, up around Pulaski, Watertown uh, uh, this evening. So uh, that is going to continue for a little while longer until this storm in the northeast uh, pulls, out, uh, pulls out and uh, gets out of the way. Here's the uh, look on the surface map tonight. You can uh, see there's a low there just south and east of Nova Scotia. Again, if you, could, if you can make out the numbers on these temperatures, they're not all that cold. You've got readings in the upper 20s to around 30 in much of Maine and New Brunswick. But it's not like when you look into southeastern Canada, you're seeing you know, big, you know, really cold numbers. There, yeah, there are some colder air uh, when you uh, move west of this cold front, this frontal boundary that's moving through. That is going to be uh, moving through uh, the uh, northeast. I mean, moving through uh, northern New Jersey, New York City, Long Island. That front's going to sweep on through. And behind it, the air is a little bit colder. You've got 20s, teens, and then you get down to uh, some low teens. But even up, when you look up into towards James Bay, low, low and mid-teens is, is nothing exceptional. And then look if you look around the Great Lakes, on the other hand, you're seeing temperatures that are generally in the upper 30s and low 40s. So it's, this is not cold air. Uh, it is just basically do-it-yourself cyclonic cold air uh, that uh, is in place. And once it works through, we're going to start to see uh, temperatures begin to uh, move up uh, and moderate ahead of the, uh, the next storm system. So uh, before we get to the models, I, I want to just really quick uh, touch upon uh, the um, snow cover over North America, which has decreased from the peak back about uh, two weeks ago a little less than two weeks ago, about 42%. Uh, that was at the time when we had the uh, big storm, so a little less than two weeks ago, uh, the big storm in the southeast. Uh, that is the snow cover today, the southern extent of it. Uh, th actually, this was a year ago. I'm sorry, but this was a year ago. The maps are actually, you know, I, I, I got a little confused because the maps actually are not that different, believe it or not. Uh, when we uh, look at the... Um, tell me I did this twice. There we go. Here's the current map. I'm sorry, because I have these images up more than once. I see what happened. Now I got it right. All right, so look. Let's start this again. So here's our snow cover today, which is down to a little less than 25%. Uh, but still, all of Canada is snow covered. Upstate New York and New England, the northern part of the Great Lakes, right along the border there with Canada. You've got some, some areas where there, you don't have much, if any, snow on the ground at all up in parts of the Dakotas and into Minnesota. And then you've got snow cover through the, the uh, northern Rockies and through parts of the Pacific Northwest. That was uh, as of Monday the 17th. But I went back and pulled last year for the same date. So now I'm going to switch back and forth. If you look closely... The only difference is that there's there's a solid, you know, a bit more of a solid snow cover from all the cold weather we had last December of solid snow cover from Minnesota through the Great Lakes, but north of Chicago, uh, into northern Ohio, Pennsylvania, all of New Jersey, Long Island, New York, and, and, uh, and the Northeast, New York, New England, all snow covered last year. Uh, but uh, in terms of what you're seeing this year, again, just to go back, it's a it, it is less, but it, it, it's not a lot less, okay? It's somewhat less. Uh, so here we are at around the same dates, and, you know, we're seeing snow cover that is perhaps about where it should be for this time of year. Uh, I, I, it's very funny because I, you know, it, it happens every December, the snow weenies have already proclaimed winter as being over. And here we are on the 17th of December, having uh, had unprecedented snowfall up through the last, um, uh, you know, through November and into the first part of December. And, you know, these, look, no one knows what the pattern is, how the pattern is going to evolve going forward. Uh, the forecasters that, the long range forecasters that, that may be leaning toward, a non-event winter, they could well, very well be right. And of course, there's a group that contends otherwise. I am Switzerland when it comes to this sort of stuff. I'm not a long-range person. I would simply point out that uh, one of these years, we're going to have a subpar year when it comes to snowfall. Uh, the uh, six out of the last seven winters uh, in uh, my neck of the woods, depending on where you are, 
Um, but many of the areas that I deal with from Eastern Pennsylvania to Southern New England uh, have had, you know, it's been a long time since we've had a below average snowfall winter for one reason or another. And one of these years, it's going to happen. Uh, the vast majority, uh, believe it or not, uh, when you look at uh, New York City statistics, um, more than like, it's about over 60 percent of the winters wind up with below average snowfall. So to have a stretch like this, which we've never seen before, of um, you know six out of the last seven being above average, uh, it can't go on forever, uh, unless it's a whole new world. And uh, so it can't go on forever. Meanwhile, I, I did pull up also the map for the end of the month of December. So there is a decided from last year in 2017 uh, between uh, in the last two weeks of December there was a significant increase in the snow cover as this reflects the very cold pattern that uh, we were in. Now, uh, with going forward in terms of the long range, I did pull up the teleconnections tonight. I, I, I do want to show you a couple of things as we've been watching these sort of evolve. Um, the East Pacific Oscillation, which to me is the one that I really want to pay the most attention to, uh, is... Uh, has changed quite a bit in the last few days, particularly in the latter part of the forecast period, now forecast to remain somewhat positive right through year end. In fact, it's even uh, still in the strongly positive zone at a point where this was supposed to uh, start um, losing altitude as far as how positive it was. Uh, when the Eastern Pacific Oscillation is positive, it means that the pressures over the geographic area that it measures, mostly it's in the North Pacific, uh, are, um, are running low. Uh, there's a lot of low pressure there. There's troughing there. Uh, that uh, effectively cuts off cold air from coming eastward. It keeps it confined and mainly in Western Canada and up toward Alaska and beyond. Uh, so you need that EPO to get down at least closer to the neutral line uh, which it really doesn't do on the forecast from last night. The uh, other thing, the, but all the, the P, all the indices have, have changed here. The uh, PNA, uh, which is off the wall positive as of today, and that's kind of reflecting, by the way, that big storm. You know, uh, the PNA, the Pacific North America Index, is a measure of the uh, the ridge in the west, trough in the east scenario. When you have a ridge in the west and the trough in the east, the PNA is going to be strongly positive. Uh, if you have less than that, you're going to see those numbers vary. And when you have the opposite, you're going to have uh, it go negative. So it does actually go somewhat negative after Christmas. The one thing that is also, the other thing that's changed too is the North Atlantic Oscillation or the NAO. And this may uh, keep, keep it from getting, again, it, I, think, I think the presence of that weak NAO has been responsible to, for keeping it from getting blowtorch warm in the east because it suppresses that ridge in the east to some degree uh, with uh, troughing out in the, in, the, in the Atlantic in the, the geographic zone between 40 north and, 50, and, and, and 55, 60 north. So if you've got lower pressures there, it's going to basically uh, keep uh, the ridge or try to keep the ridge in the east somewhat suppressed. And it does have the NAO is slightly to somewhat negative but not strongly negative uh, right till about Christmas, then it gets, then it kind of straddles the neutral line toward the end of the year. So I, again, I think that's that's what's really basically keeping um, keeping us from going into what would would would, would be uh, a blowtorch pattern. So let's set up now the uh, next weather system that's coming. First off, uh, if you look carefully here on the NAM, which is what I'm starting with, a lot of isobars. You got high pressure sitting in Illinois. Uh, 982 low south of Nova Scotia, big pressure change, relatively small distance, tight pressure gradient. So we're going to have gusty winds right through Tuesday until that low finally begins to pull away, which it really doesn't do until later tomorrow afternoon. And then the high builds into the east. It stays quiet here, but now you're going to start to see uh, energy that is <clears throat> swinging out of the uh, plains, north and southern plains. And we begin to uh, we begin to generate uh, rain going into Thursday, and here's where you know I'm talking about the possibility for later Thursday, actually later Thursday, Thursday night of some severe weather 
uh, possibly for Florida. But this is low pressure that's going to be headed up the Appalachian Mountains. There's not going to be any re uh, any redevelopment here. Often, you know, sometimes you get these lows, they'll come up. They only get so far north. But this low is going to deepen as it moves up. So we're going to get through rounds of rain Thursday night uh, into, and this is only uh, through 1 a.m., on uh, Friday morning. So at this point, we're going to switch over to the GFS and then I'll show you what's going on in the upper air. This is not the radar, just to be, be clear, while the, the NAM shows you the radar presentation, the GFS actually shows you uh, rainfall. And you know, you've know you got your low uh, running up the west side of the Appalachians and intensifying as it moves into the St. Lawrence Valley. So you're going to get some heavy rains here and some strong south-southeast winds or southeast winds Thursday night into Friday morning, it may actually get very windy. There's there's a hint on the GFS of you've got a surface low in eastern Tennessee, but if you look close, there's a closed isobar there. There's probably some kind of low, maybe a point of occlusion low or a warm frontal wave of some kind uh, sitting off the New Jersey coast. So that's going to really tighten the pressure gradient up for uh, areas close to me and through southern New England. So it may get very windy. Uh, late Thursday night, early Friday morning, we'll struggle to, to, to figure out whether this warm front's going to get through. Sometimes they like to come through, sometimes they don't. And then we'll wait for the frontal boundary to, to shift through here Friday night into Saturday. I, I think an argument can be made that, uh, that you could wind up seeing this, you, you know, you get your shot of rain with the arm that moves up the coast. And then once that goes by, you wait for the cold front and, you know, the rains kind of get more wide, scattered and showery in nature for later Thursday afternoon, into, I'm sorry, later Friday afternoon into Friday night. So uh, how it progresses for areas to the south, well, uh, this is Thursday where you start to see that rain advancing. So by Thursday night, uh, by Thursday evening, 7 p.m., the rain is all over the place from Virginia, uh, I'm sorry, from southern Pennsylvania and New Jersey to about New York City. Uh, down through Virginia, West Virginia, uh, North and South Carolina. Uh, the uh, rain will then spread further north up into New England. Notice it's so warm that you got to go into Maine to find enough trapped cold air for some uh, freezing rain or sleet. And even there, it's minimal. And then the low pulls away to the northeast. The model has been trying to make a little bit of a changeover at the end for perhaps the mountains down into West Virginia uh, and Western PA, Eastern Ohio. But again, the amount of cold air that's behind this is is not very much at all. So I don't know how much you're gonna be able to do with that uh, with regards to a changeover. And then it lifts on up uh, to the Northeast. Uh, the European, and this is probably a good point that we can, train. Oh, you know what, before we do that, let me just show you the, uh, we'll show you the, uh, NAM, the, uh, the GFS's accumulated precept and Again, you, the convective nature, bringing the, the heaviest stuff, you see it through Florida. This reflects that possibility of some strong thunderstorms later Thursday or Thursday night. And maybe even some more action on Friday. There might be some kind of secondary front moving through and staying near or off the Carolina coast. But inland areas, uh, with the low where it's tracking, it would tend to favor the heaviest rains going west of the low track. Uh, as it moves up the Appalachians, where you start to see those that that streaky bright with a hint of pink in it, that's about two to three inches. And then to the east of the mountains, you're talking about a one to two uh, inch rainfall, but I think it might wind up being higher than that. It, the model certainly uh, underperformed in terms of rainfall for my area. I had a lot of spots that got two, three inches plus uh, with the rains from yesterday and and and. Uh, some places had a combination of heavy rain yesterday and heavy rain on on uh, Saturday. So now uh, we can go, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, shift over to the European model and work with the upper air on the European model. So hang on, folks. So here's what's happening, by the way, <clears throat> with respect to the upper air. If you think back to last week, uh, to the system that we were dealing with this past weekend. We had the northern stream and the southern stream in the jet staying completely separate. The short waves in both streams were pretty much mistimed so that there was no real phasing that was going to go on. It's only now that it's reached south of Nova Scotia that you're seeing this thing getting energized by the upper trough in the northern part of the jet. 
Well, this time around, it's different. Uh, this time around, uh, you are seeing uh, the models, all the models doing this. And I'll bring up the trusty paint box, which is always good to use to uh, illustrate what's going on in the upper air. But give me a chance here to, to uh, I don't know why the frame, why is it so big? And now it's too small. All right, hang on, folks. Let me just see what, what if I can correct this. All right, well, this will be the best I could do. But this is our upper air here for uh, Thursday. And the difference this time around is the fact that we are seeing um, phasing going on here. All right. Hang on, folks. I'm having a, a bit of an evil time. Okay, here we go. But you are seeing uh, uh, the, the big difference here is the fact that the northern stream and the southern stream of the jets are now in phase here. Here's the southern stream. There's the northern stream. So they're all getting locked up. So as a result, you do get a rather strong ridge that builds uh, just barely off the east coast. And your flow... Uh, is you know north south southwest north northeast so any surface low which is likely to be generated by by the uh, the southern the southern stream shortwave is going to uh, make a sharp turn and move northward uh, there's nothing to hold it back because this whole trough is going to be swinging around and and going negative and that is uh, you know that's the big difference here between what happened uh, this weekend and what is going on now if you watch this trough it, the whole thing just kind of lifts up uh, and goes somewhat negative uh, as it runs to the northeast as a phased entity now here's where the models begin to differ after this goes by it's probably better if I widen it out because we can we can follow it along a bit better this is the uh, European model for Saturday next Saturday there's a short wave that has come into the west that the model picks up on. And as we move into Sunday, you can see it there in eastern Nebraska. You have a, a, a flow, a slightly colder flow coming down out of Canada. It's not the strongest jet in the world, but it's enough that it probably feeds in a little bit of cold air. And the European is actually holding on to this short wave as it moves through, uh, the, uh, through Pennsylvania and western New York down into northern Virginia. This is now Christmas Eve. This is what the model makes uh, with regards to a low that is going to come out of the, of the plains and move pretty quickly across the Ohio Valley and head toward uh, northern West Virginia or central PA, somewhere in there. It stays relatively weak and then just kind of translates out to the east. Because if you look at the way the whole jet stream is structured here, there's you've got short you've got energy running around all over the place uh there's no way for for phasing to go on there it's not like what we're going to be seeing late this week with the upper air so dynamic this is a um, very much a um, a weak looking upper air and, and then of course it's long gone by the time we get to christmas day but i just want to show you that the european is the only one that's really doing this because if you look at the gfs the upper air I mean, you could pick out there's a weak short wave from southern Illinois down into northern Mississippi, and then there's another short wave that's in the, east, in the eastern part of the Dakotas. But, you know, again, very weak on the GFS. It does absolutely, you could barely find it as it moves toward the coast, and therefore it doesn't do anything with it. Uh, it it's, it's um, here, this is, this is Monday at 12Z. I'll go back to the European, and you can see the difference. The European has a definable short wave. And, and the Europeans been doing this uh, for the last, since Saturday. So it, it's, it, it's, it hasn't backed away from it. Uh, but on the other hand, none of the other models have gone toward it. So we remain split. Uh, I uh, have said, you know, uh, in, my, in my discussions and in my forecast that the door is left open because the European does have something there. After that, as we go through the latter part of next week, uh, the pattern uh, gets, uh, you know, it, it doesn't, re it, 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 there's, a, there's a little bit of cold air at low levels that builds up into Canada with the surface high 
but you got a pretty big ridge that's being popped up. Uh, this is the GFS, by the way, popping up this big ridge in the eastern part of the United States for the latter part of next week. Okay, uh, the European uh, is different. The European uh, has you know a little bit of ridging, but it doesn't go crazy with it. Uh, and you do have action in the northern jet that might suppress the the, the, the ridge in the east. Uh, as we go through the, the, the last days of, of December, I don't know. There's a lot of energy dropping into the West. There's a, a deep trough that drops into the Southwest on the, on the European at uh, day 10. And then there's another strong shortwave trough that's coming into the Pacific Northwest at the time. The upper air, to me, uh, you know, I thought it was kind of interesting to see this look. Uh, it, I mean, it, it looks like it's trying to change. If you, if you go back, if you look at it... The, early on if you watch the flow of the european early on flow is basically west to east across uh, much of the u.s and southern canada we have you know this this very minute uh, connection of cold air briefly that's coming down now and then it goes back to this sort of messy west to east flow uh, that amorphous trough that's off in the west a ridge on both coasts at the end of this week with the deep trough in the middle. Again, not much of a polar connection here. Uh, going into next week, a, a ton of short waves running around, so who knows uh, how the models play onto it. But toward the end, it looks like it's trying to do something. I'm not sure where it's going, uh, but it looks like it's trying to morph into something uh, for uh, the early part of January. Perhaps this is the beginning of a change. I don't know. Um, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I, I think a theory has been put forward that uh, perhaps what we're seeing now is the quote-unquote thaw. Uh, if, you, I, if you think that the pattern from, say, October 15th to November, December 1st or so was, um, you know, a first shot across the bow, getting a bit of a break from that now, and that we're going to then go into a wintry pattern uh, to take us into January and February, and maybe this year for the first time in a in a while, we have spring arriving when it's supposed to be arriving. I don't know. That's one theory that I saw put out there by uh, by cranky weather guy who's on Twitter, who I uh, who I follow, and um, he does a good job. I have to tell you, uh, I I I I, uh, I don't read him all the time, but I do see his tweets from time to time, and I think he does a very very good. I think he's very good at what he does. Uh, very good at analysis. So if you're not following him, you should follow him. Uh, so, you know, this is, it's hard to say where this is all going to wind up. I think this is probably a good time to, to uh, take a look at the stratosphere because this is really interesting. Um, you know, there've been, there's been uh, all, you know, talk about the, the, the uh, what's going on in the stratosphere toward the end of the month. We're seeing, um, um, signs of the polar vortex being attacked uh, and uh, weakening and you know I was looking at uh, today's and over the last couple of days uh, if, if we look at this as on the uh, on tropical tidbits you have to pull up this hemispheric view if you want to look at it but this is you know what it looks like in the stratosphere I'm going to bring it back to the beginning or actually go back a couple of days before uh, but what's interesting is you know watch the area off the coast of Af Africa. So go to the uh, the far left, the far uh, right, uh, down about halfway uh, down the picture, where you're between um, uh, 60, where you see minus 60 and minus 56. You'll see this is brownish patch there uh, off the uh, coast of Africa. That is uh, warm air in, in, near and over Morocco. And as we move through time, you're going to see this warm air. Just try and follow that, that brownish blob and watch what happens as it crosses uh, Asia and then swings around and then amplifies. It gets this is really warm air that pushes up into the Arctic region and attacks the polar vortex. And you'll notice as that brown area is expanding, the dark blue area is beginning to shrink. So if, if you... The idea is, because the stratosphere works differently than the bottom part of the atmosphere, if you weaken the polar vortex in the upper atmosphere, that kind of opens the door for uh, cold weather to come into the eastern United States, if this is what you're looking for. 
And as we go through uh, the last days of, of December, you know, this polar vortex gets really stretched out and attacked and weakens considerably. It almost splits here as this big upper high builds up into the Arctic region. So uh, the, the, uh, the argument is that the, weak, the weakening of, this, the, of the whole polar vortex of the stratosphere uh, is usually at a time where you do wind up with colder weather, uh, colder than normal weather developing in the eastern part of the U.S., it's something that lags when it happens up in the stratosphere. It takes a some time for it to work down to the bottom of the atmosphere. So that would suggest that maybe when we get toward, uh, because this last map is actually January 2nd, so you might have to give it another 10 days or so for it to play out. But it, uh, it suggests that maybe after the first week of January, we could be going into a, a very wintry pattern across the eastern part of the United States. This is what it, what it, what it suggests. And, and I, I don't, I don't follow this, uh, you know, I, I, I'm kind of learning this part of it. This is not something that we, we covered when I went to school in any, in, in even a minor fashion. But, uh, you know, Dr. Judah Cohen is, uh, you know, this is what he does his work on. And I'm, I'm a lot, you know, I've been trying to read him on a regular basis on his blog to, to get a, a better understanding of how this all plays out and, and what it all means. It's very interesting. Uh, a lot of it's over my head, you know, admittedly. Uh, I've run this by some of my colleagues, and uh, it's also over their heads, so I'm not alone. It's a tough, you know, it, it's, it's a tough thing to understand uh, how it all plays out, uh, but very interesting. So I'm just kind of translating to you what he's been saying, and I hope I've, I've translated it um, correctly. If not, I'll probably hear about it. But um, again, something to keep an eye on down the road in terms of the overall pattern. Uh, no guarantees, by the way, that it'll all play out. Uh, of course, uh, you know, again, that was today's model snapshot, and things could very well change. But uh, what we're seeing, this is December 17th, folks. Uh, December, one of those months where, you know, every so often you get a big snowstorm at the end of the month, but much of the time, uh, December is um, kind of how it is right now. The atmosphere is getting ready to go into a wintertime mode, trying to figure out where it's going to line up all the chess pieces, and hasn't really figured it all out yet. So uh, if, if, uh, if you're getting nervous, uh, it's, it's kind of silly to do that now. You know, it just is. If it winds up being a subpar year, you're all, you all will point back to how the fact that winter was over in December. Well... You know, it's all fine and dandy in hindsight. Uh, you can't forecast. Uh, if hindsight were the way to forecast, you'd never get the forecast wrong, although I know some people out there that would, that would probably find a way. Uh, but no matter. Okay. Uh, models are suspect, and the pick looks like a, the Pepsi logo. <laughs> Seth Dominus, I, you know what? Thinking of, now that I think about it, yeah, I guess it does kind of look like that. Not that they're a sponsor of this program, unless they want to be. Um, let's see. Uh, it is a difficult read, Scott uh, Briller. I have a tough time with it. It's it, uh, but little by little, I'm, I'm, you know, I gain little. I get, I get, I gain nuggets here and there. Uh, so David, you've got your cover. You got the answer now. You know, as we just talked about that stratus, uh, he's very bullish on this uh, uh, this stratospheric warming event. Uh, that's taking place over the next uh, couple of weeks, uh, so um, just just um, we'll 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 keep reading his tweets. If he, and if you know when he as he uh, talks more about it, I'll try to translate it out. Uh, James Hines, the um, Grand Solar uh, Minimum. Uh, there, you know, I asked actually, I asked Dr. Cohen about this. There's been a lot of you know there is a lot of research that they're doing uh, corresponding to that to see. Uh, to see where um, you know where all that's going. Uh, I see. Uh, let's see, Johnny Quest, are you on? Are, are you on right now? Was somebody misbehaving? <laughs> all right, I guess so. Uh, someone named Supa uh, was uh, misbehaving. Uh, Michael Witherspoon, uh, welcome for Alabama, Friday the 22nd. It shows the freezing line well below Alabama, but it shows rain. What does that mean, or how do you think it would play out? Okay, 
let me take a look at what you're what you're saying first with respect to the freezing line um so hang on one second here uh, okay let me get to the map i have a i have a feeling what you're driving at but let's take a look all right let's back off and that freezing line by the way makes sense because of how deep the trough is it goes so far to the south okay so I'm looking at Saturday morning uh, temperatures on the GFS, which have low 30s all the way down through central Alabama. And, uh, in fact, I'll bring the map up here so you can see it. As soon as I can bring it back to the top. All right, now I have to find it. There it is. It's funny how I lose all this stuff. Okay, let's see if I can bring that up to the top now. All right, so here's your uh, map. <clears throat> this is the, uh, these are the, the uh, 7 a.m., the uh, 6 a.m. temperatures, depending on what time zone you're in, uh, for Saturday morning. So that's the uh, uh, temperatures, and here's the precip. Precip's long gone, okay? It's long gone. Now, uh, as, as that trough pulls out, it does actually show a little bit of light blue uh, in parts of northern Alabama. I, I wouldn't right now put too much stock into this. Uh, it's too far down the road. Uh, it's reflecting the very, very cold upper air because of the deep trough. If I bring the upper air, I can't do it on this tight shot. Um, actually, I can. Uh, but the upper low, you see it there down there sitting... Uh, in southern Alabama, it's very, very cold air aloft here. So uh, it, you know, it it, it tr eventually just tries to translate down to the surface as the trough lifts out. But the precip, for the most part, is long gone. So I don't think it's going to be something that causes you uh, a whole lot, if anything at all. Uh, <clears throat> the GFS would certainly imply that with the upper low where it is, uh, that there could certainly be a couple of. Uh, rain mixed with snow showers type of thing I, that's that's just an early early guess on my part I, w I would I would sort of wait till we get there but uh, I, I can't imagine the, the uh, anything else happening that would change it to something um, <clears throat> um, more widespread okay this is the back end the end of the trough and the end of the system as it lifts on out um, to the northeast but it you know it is going to get cold as, until that trough lifts up and out. How, how would uh, Northeast Mountain ski conditions look for next weekend? Gunter 98 with that wide with that rain going all the way up, not good at all. Uh, that's gonna that's gonna have some impact on the snow cover up in New England uh, with that warm air getting all the way up. Now it will get cold behind it, so at least it's not going to be warm for 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 more than a, the 24 hour period. But uh, the rain's gonna wash away some of that snow up. Uh, in ski country, they'll probably be able to make it uh, once the once the low goes by. I don't think it'll wash all of it away because there's been quite a bit of it over the last uh, six weeks or so, uh, and certainly in Maine. Uh, but I got to tell you, you're going to want to go to the northern, the, the more northern ski areas after what happens late this week with this uh, next weather system. What kind of pattern did we have around Christmas 1983 that sent record cold down the East Coast? That was the coldest Christmas I've seen. I got to go back and look. Uh, the 83-84 winter doesn't really overly stand out in my memory. Uh, but um, uh, the uh, I'll have to go back and do a little research on that in terms of what kind of winter it was. I don't remember it as being a particularly snowy winter. Uh, it also was a year where I wasn't here. Now, 83-84. Okay. So I had just gone to New Orleans in late 1983, and, and that cold air, there was Arctic highs that kept coming down. It really impacted the deep south, because we got down to the single digits uh, in New Orleans and set uh, you know, all-time record lows uh, in, uh, in, in around New Year's. Uh, I remember um, uh, it, it being so cold that it, the uh, electricity, you know, in New Orleans, uh, the uh, the very very cold weather puts a big strain on the electrical grid more so than the hot weather in the summertime and uh, it, uh, it you know it shut the power down uh, in, a, in a lot of places that was brutal so I think that there was a brutally cold pattern that set up in December and, and, and uh, for the first part of January but I have to go back and kind of refresh refresh my mind 
uh, LeBron fan. The uh, parallel GFS from what I saw didn't do very much earlier, but I will give it a check for you. Let's see if it's if it's any different. Uh, I will uh, bring it up on the screen. Well, let's see. I'll run it through fast because I'm. Here we go. So let's see. Nope, the parallel has nothing, okay? The parallel has nothing for Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, just cold and dry. And then after that, low to the lakes, energy to the east. Let's have a lot of cold air. That's interesting, toward the end of the period. Ah, that's interesting. So let's, you know what? I'm going to look at the upper air. I'm not going to comment too much. I want to see the upper air. All right. Well, I mean, it's not terrible. Uh, I can see why it's doing what it's doing. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm keeping it a big mystery. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hang on one second. I don't want everybody to just start, you know, jumping up and down. This is going to be the operational GFS come next month. So we're going to go to a different... Uh, a different model. The parallel is is a little more bullish. Of course, it still has a ridge later next week. Uh, then after that, you start to get a little bit of a repair job out in the Pacific. Uh, you got a bit of a colder look that develops uh, in in uh, eastern Canada. There's a bit of a connection there from the poles from uh, uh, northern Greenland. Uh, northwestern Greenland down into southeastern Canada. This isn't like day 11 or 12. So we got to get there first. And then it's got the, that next deep trough that comes into the west. Not the first one, which you see here. Okay. This is, well, this is later next week now. Uh, but then you've got the second one that comes in. This is what the model says. And then it does something uh, exciting for snow lovers right around New Year's. So very nice. The parallel GFS has something, you know, something of consequence right around New Year's Day. That's on this run. Uh, talk to me about it a week from now, okay? <laughs> then I can get a little bit more uh, excited over it. We got to figure out where this upper air pattern is going as we head uh, into uh, late December and January. I, I got a, I, I got a hunch with, with everything that's going on in the upper atmosphere that we are going to see a wintry pattern set up <clears throat> in the Eastern United States, okay? Uh, I'm not going to hedge about it. That's what I think. Uh, I think that we are going to eventually go back to a wintry pattern. And I think it may come uh, a little sooner rather than later. Uh, maybe maybe around New Year's or a little bit after that. Wouldn't sh wouldn't shock me. All right? If I'm wrong, I will openly admit that I, I'm wrong. All right? But that's what uh, what I'm seeing. Uh, uh, you want... <laughs> Seth Dominus wants me to make my own model and call it the Seagar model. Uh, and, you, and patent it. Okay. <laughs> if I'll, I can't even get, you know, I've got, I, I've got so many other <laughs> issues i got to deal with. I'm not, no, that's not happening. Um, what is the Euro saying for this rain this week, Ben McGinnis? Pretty much the same as the GFS. The, the models are all pretty well lined up with this, this weather system for the end of the week. Maybe the timing is a little different from run to run, but it's a big rain for everybody. Uh, it, it, the same trough, full, you know, it's funny. When it comes to big rain events uh, and full latitude troughs that to our west, the models nail that, you know, like that. Perfect, almost perfectly. But when it comes to dealing with snow, it's, it's, it's a whole, whole uh, another matter. Um... No, William Hoover, winter is not over. It hasn't started. All right, come on. By the way, um, I was thinking back to the winter of 1415, I believe it was, where we didn't get our first inch of snow uh, to, to accumulate until the very first week of January, believe it or not. There was hardly any snow of consequence in December. December was a mild month. Temperatures averaged about three or four degrees above normal there was no snow in november that year uh so december uh was uh warmer than average it wasn't until the middle of january that uh the uh, the entire upper atmosphere just went into collapse mode 
And uh, it started with the infamous half blizzard uh, around, was it January 23rd, 24th? Just pulling dates out of, out of my head. And then after that, it was brutally cold right until the end of March. Everything froze. It was one of the coldest Februarys we've had uh, in many, many years. I think it was in the top, uh, I want to say it was in New York City. It wound up being in the top seven or top five. Uh, I got to go back and look. But it was a brutally cold February and a cold uh, and somewhat snowy March. So uh, you can't take in, you, you can't look at what's happening now and draw any conclusion. And I've had a couple of people mention to me, it was interesting stats. Uh, <clears throat> New York City, uh, above 60 inches uh, for rainfall, okay? Uh, in the eight times where that's happened before, the, snow, the winters uh, were all below average in terms of snowfall, all eight. Okay, but the problem with that is that uh, a bunch of those 60 plus years came in the period from 1970 to 2000 when 25 out of the 30 winters were below average anyway. So um, you can make the argument, two arguments you can make is that it's a very, very small data set. And the second thing is that if, if you think that if it came at a time where cyclically it was a low snowfall period from 1970 to 2000. Yeah, they probably are going to be below normal. So you got to be careful when you look at stats like that and say, uh, in years that this has happened, we've gotten this result. Therefore, uh, you can't do that. Uh, a, a lot of people, you know, a few people said to me about when we've had winters where, where we, when we've had a lot of months where we've had a lot of snow in November, December winds up being not getting very much. Well, look, the fact is that uh, nine out of 10 Novembers, you get no snow at all, okay? Snowfalls in Novembers uh, are, 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 at least in New York City anyway, are very unusual. And 90% of the time, you're not gonna get any snow at all. And you're going to have subpar Decembers more often than not anyway. So. Uh, it's it it it's not a leading indicator. It may be a coincident indicator where uh, you get a snowy November. Well, you only get snowy Novembers once every ten years, and if you know if if, if on average uh, six or seven of your Decembers are below average because of the fact that December's numbers are skewed higher because there have been a number of big snowstorms in the month of December. But you get a lot of years in December where you get very little. So if most Decembers you wind up with very little snow, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily, there's no real correlation that you could say that, well, because we got, we got uh, a lot of snow in the month of November that we're going to get, it's often that it's going to be followed by a December where you don't get as much, okay? Uh, there's, just, you, 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 it, there's just not enough data there uh, to, to make any kind of a correlation. Uh, the data set is too small. And it may be coincident because of the fact that, well, most Decembers you don't get a lot of snow, uh, at least when it comes to New York City and definitely when it comes to Philadelphia and Washington. All right, going to leave it there, folks. We're 55 minutes in. Thanks for being here tonight. I really, really appreciate it. Let me just uh, really quick, uh, I don't know, there it is. Uh, for those of you who are new to my channel, welcome and thanks for being here. Do please subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is absolutely free. Uh, and you'll, you can set it so that you get notifications uh, when I do these live streams, which is um, usually about once a day. Uh, a number of you are on my Patreon uh, platform, which is my paid prescription uh, platform, uh, paid subscription platform. <laughs> Let me start that again. My paid subscription platform. Uh, you might be prescribed to go at it to relieve your... Uh, inner need for weather all of the time but nonetheless that'll be your decision it's just two dollars a month and uh, that two bucks by the way uh, helps me out uh, with regards to uh, building my little empire here so thank you very much for those who have joined and again it's just two dollars a month you get uh, posts just for patreon members you get exclusive live streams just for patreon members and you can message me anytime for a timely response i just put the link up uh, up there. For those of you who are in northern New Jersey, Long Island, New York City, southern Connecticut, uh, and the lower Hudson Valley, uh, I have an app on Google Play. 
and uh, you can download it. The app is absolutely free, uh, and I've just put the link up there for you uh, so uh, you can uh, keep uh, in touch with the weather via my uh, posts uh, that I do for my uh, app and for my website, but you get it nice and clean on the app, uh, and uh, they come up, they load fast. There'll be an iPhone version of this uh, coming up shortly. I know I've been saying that every day for the last three weeks, still kind of working on it and still kind of waiting for Apple. But as soon as they, uh, they say, okay, uh, we'll, uh, we'll put the link out there for you. And you can uh, also uh, find that when it happens. It'll be on my uh, Facebook page, uh, Meteorologist Joe Chaffee. There are less than seven shopping days till Christmas. And uh, one way you can uh, support, another way you can support my channel, which really won't cost you anything, uh, if you uh, shop on Amazon and you do it for, through my Amazon link, we're a participant in the Amazon Services LLC Associates program, which is an affiliate advertising program designed to provide a means for us to earn fees from Amazon uh, by linking to Amazon.com and their affiliated sites. So if you shop on Amazon through that link, you get your stuff, and Amazon. We'll put some uh, cigars in my Christmas stocking. And thank you very much for those of you who have uh, used the Amazon link. Uh, Joe and Joe, a weather show tonight on Facebook at 9.20 Eastern Time on my Facebook page, Meteorologist Joe Chaffee. And uh, if you miss it and you've got the app, or if you're not on Facebook but you have uh, an Android device, uh, I usually put the show on there. And uh, you can watch it uh, later tonight if I get it done in time or for sure. Uh, by uh, tomorrow morning and then tomorrow we'll be on our regular schedule which means our an, another YouTube live stream at 7 o'clock Eastern time and the Joe and Joe show will follow uh, after that on Facebook at 9 15. Thanks very much for being here tonight folks really appreciate it and uh, we will uh, see you tomorrow.